Yes, welcome from Stockholm and a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Christina Birke Daniels and I'm the new director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung here in the Nordic countries. We are, as most of you know, one of the German political foundations and work on political dialogue between Germany and the five Nordic countries. We concentrate on the most important issues of our time and strengthening democracy is a big pillar of our work. We do believe that all over the world there are very serious threats to democracy, to our democracies, and uh, we are engaged in various constructive efforts to solve the problems leading to these threats. Um, Maybe some of you know, in 2020 and 2021, the FES Nordics office has invited researchers and civil society organizations to participate in a series of online exchanges. You find the videos uh, still online um, of these great seminars. And the aim was to strengthen ties between individuals and organizations that work on combating right-wing extremism in the Nordic countries and in Germany. And our hope is that in the long term, we can establish a Nordic German expert and civil society network. Um, the report that we are launching today uh, sort of summarizes some findings of the exchange, and I'm sure during our discussion, we can uh, also put some of the newest developments uh, into the discussion. The event is organized by us, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Regional Office of the Nordic Countries, and also in close collaboration with our project partners from the Amadeo Antonio Foundation, and also another the FES project, uh, which is called Countering the Far Right. I will now hand over to my dear colleague, Josephine Fürst, who will do the moderation and lead us through the day today. I hope we will have very interesting discussions. Thank you, Christina. So we, we have chosen to record today's um, uh, event. And because of that, we've chosen a webinar format, which means that the panelists will be visible, uh, but no other participants. But you can still um, uh, you can use the chat and the Q&A function if you want to pose any questions. We're a bit limited time wise today, though. Um, I've posted the report in the chat, so you can, if you haven't downloaded it, you can get it there. And before we start, I would also really like to thank uh, the participants who took part of the first part of the project and Hendrik Arnstad, the journalist and historian who who was a very, very important part uh, of that first part of this project. But now um, we should start with the reason we're here, um, the presentation uh, of Nicholas Potter's report, Mapping the Far Right. I'm very happy and proud to present our author. Nicholas Potter, you're a British German journalist and researcher at the Amadeo Fan uh, Antonio Foundation in Berlin. You work as an editor at the Foundation's journalism project, Belltau News, and focuses on the German and international far right, antisemitism, racism, conspiracy ideolo uh, ideologies, and more. The screen is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me just uh, share my screen. Right, did that work? Can everyone see my presentation? Yes, it's fine. Okay, great. Thanks for joining me today. So I'll, I'll just be giving an overview of the report today, presenting a few key findings uh, and telling you a bit more, but obviously I can recommend you just to read the whole thing. Uh, so first of all, a bit about um, the Amadeo Antonio Foundation. We're named after um, Amadeo Antonio, who was um, uh, a contract worker from Angola in the GDR and uh, after the war fell, uh, tragically, he was one of the first uh, victims of right-wing violence uh, in Germany after uh, 1990. Um, uh, our organization also counts uh, the number of uh, victims of right-wing violence since then. Uh, I believe uh, we're currently at 213 uh, victims um, since reunification in Germany. Uh, yeah, and we were founded in 1998, and we uh, we uh, advise, write reports, but also fund uh, projects um, uh, over 1,400 to date. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the report, here's a lot of logos, uh, just to sort of uh, show a few of the key players that are mentioned in the report. Um, I guess uh, maybe one question 
the report would maybe be trying to address is how do we get from the, the fancy, the nice harmless looking flower and blue tick logos on the left to the rather sort of uh, doomy skull and crossbones and radioactive signs uh, on the right. Um, how are these groups connected? Where are the continuities? Um, and where are the overlaps? So if I get rid of the names for a second. Um, I, mean, I think one of my points in the, in the report would be that the way from the left to the right of this screen here is through the various connections, ideological overlaps, um, networking, that the way is actually from the parliaments to the armed underground is uh, a lot shorter than maybe many people think. So um, looking at what's actually in the report, um, it's divided into three sections, essentially. Um, the first is uh, major far right movements in Northern Europe. I'll go into these three sections in a bit more detail in a sec. The second is uh, the international cooperation of, of these far right groups. Um, and the third section is uh, a plan of action. So for, for concrete policy proposals for combating right wing extremism. So if we look at the first part of the report, um, major far right movements in Northern Europe. Um, in the first part, I'm looking at uh, populist to radical right parties, for example, the AFD, the Sweden Democrats, the Finns party, the Danish People's Party. I use the term populist right here um, very cautiously because uh, I think that still there's a tendency, for example, to refer to the AFD as a populist right party. The AFD, um, uh, even the, the federal party structure is now um, under observation by intelligence services uh, as a suspected case of right wing extremism. I would argue that the AFD is a far right party, not a populist right party, uh, but the report also goes into this uh, as well. So alongside uh, these uh, parties, which I guess is a, a new attempt to rebrand elements of the far right that uh, aren't new at all, uh, I then go on to look at far right movements and neo-Nazi networks. So we have Hammerskins, Nordic Resistance Movement will probably be familiar to most of you, the Soldiers of Odin, um, Der Dritte Weg, or in English, the Third Path, uh, the NPD, uh, NPD and uh, Atomwaffen Division and its various offshoots like Feuerkrieg Division, Sonnenkrieg Division. And then finally, another element of modern uh, right-wing extremism I felt important to look at at the same time was um, image boards, Terragram, which is what we're calling the, um, the sort of explosion of far-right terrorism on, on the chat service Telegram, um, and also the gamification of far-right terror, which, uh, which we have uh, seen with an alarming frequency, especially from, from 2018, 19 onwards. <clears throat> Going into the second part of the report then, so international cooperation of far-right groups. Um, Nordic resistance, uh, I found very fascinating as, as a group, uh, just because they seem to be uh, incredibly well connected with various movements um, uh, across, across Europe and internationally. Uh, I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a sec, um, but in a way, a lot of the lines on this map kept sort of drawing back to them, even though I realized that that's a, it's an organization that may be in, uh, in crisis at the moment after the ban in Finland, and they've had various offshoots and uh, attempts to rebrand themselves into new names. In Sweden, obviously, there was, uh, there was the split, uh, but still I felt it though as, as, a, as a sort of a pan-Scandinavian network uh, still had a lot of connections. Um, something else I'm also looking at in more detail uh, in the report is the role of Rechtsrock, um, which is basically a term uh, mostly used to refer to far-right rock music, although as, a, as an academic term also would also apply to other forms of far-right music that aren't necessarily classically rock. What I'm specifically looking at is far-right concerts and festivals, um, how they serve as uh, international meetup points uh, and networking events and what economic role they play for the far-right as well. Um, and then uh, this sort of ties in quite nicely with the, 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 the far right festivals um, is mixed martial arts, MMA, um, far right fighting tournaments uh, are also on the rise, uh, be it in Sweden or in Germany. Uh, and in the case of Germany, for example, one of the most prominent far right um, fighting events, the Kampf der Nibelung, uh, actually took place uh, also at a far right rock festival as sort of like a sub event within that. Um, and this is obviously uh, another kind of um, literal and metaphorical 
battleground for ideology, uh, a space of radicalization, uh, a lucrative economic opportunity as well, and also somewhere where like, um, you know, pure far right male aggression is just sort of let uh, loose in the ring. Um, and then finally, the third part of the um, report is uh, concrete policy proposals. So if you see on the photo here on the bottom right, um, uh, this is actually um, back in autumn, the Amadeo Antonio Foundation, uh, we formulated a list of concrete uh, policy proposals to the new uh, federal government in Germany whilst the coalition negotiations were still ongoing. Uh, we, we rented three big billboards and we changed messages and we, we parked them outside the Bundestag, outside the police headquarters in Berlin, um, and also uh, in front of the Humboldt Forum. Um, so these uh, demands in the report are, are essentially like based on, on the, the demands we had of the coalition government, but um, I've expanded them, I've adapted them for uh, an international European audience, uh, fine-tuned a few in discussion. We also had, um, we had an event a few months ago where these, we had a seminar where we just, uh, with um, various people and activists, politicians from across Scandinavian Germany, where we uh, went into the details and discussed where are the overlaps, where do we see uh, potential to um, make these demands even stronger. And the result is the, the list of 20 concrete policy recommendations in the report. Um, I won't list them all now, but I can say that um, they're divided into four sections. So the first section of measures is called um, prosecute right-wing extremists and protect victims. Uh, the second uh, policy block is uh, combat anti-Semitism and conspiracy ideologies. The third is uh, structural work on racism. And the fourth is protect and promote an independent civil society. So if I um, go to the next uh, slide, I just wanted to talk about a few key takeaways from the report. There's no by my, no means an exhaustive list, and maybe it's also important to mention that the report is an, is an exhaustive list of every single far right group ever and every single connection and network. It's um it's more a snapshot, an illustration of where where the problem lies, how what these dynamics look like, uh, how this radicalization and networking con looks in practice, and and what we can do about it. So um, some of the key takeaways here, um, the rebranding of far right ideas through radical populist right wing parties across Europe has been largely successful, unfortunately. If we look at the left, uh, the bottom image is uh, from the identitarian movement of uh, right wing extremist group uh, that operates across Austria, Germany, France, etc. On their banner is a uh, stop den großen Austausch, stop the great replacement. Um, it's a conspiracy narrative, an anti-immigrant, often anti-Semitic um, conspiracy narrative that there's some kind of secret plan, uh, often mas uh, masterminded by Jews to replace the white European population with uh, Islam migrants. So this is a far right fringe conspiracy narrative. And then in the image above, we're seeing a Facebook post by the youth organization of the AFD in Germany. Um, and above the image, they've written, uh, stop Islamization, stop the great replacement. So here we're, we're, we're seeing how these far right ideas are entering the political um, discourse through an elected party. Ideas that were once uh, uh, part of the extreme fringe are now um, finding a much bigger audience. But my second uh, um, point to make about this section would be that from the AFD to the Sweden Democrats, these newly elected uh, parties, I say newly elected in the grand scheme of, of, of right wing extremism, have close ties to violent far right individuals and groups. So the report makes some um, overlaps. Um, for example, um, the sort of uh, alleged ongoing friendship between um, Björn Höcker, leader of the AFD in Turingia, and the uh, violent neo Nazi and far right rock festival organizer. Torsten Heiser, but also in Sweden, uh, in Finland and, and Denmark, uh, we're seeing something similar, where there's this uh, veneer of, of supposedly democratic respectability, but underneath the surface, we're seeing that these uh, connections uh, to the violent organized far right do very much exist. Um, and then I would argue that the parliamentary success of these parties has smashed the Overton window of political acceptability. So it's um, pushed, uh, public uh, political discourse to the right. It's, it's shattered various norms um, and it's basically ultimately um, 
poison public discourse. And I think we can maybe go into that more in the question and answers, and I'm very looking forward to hearing the perspectives uh, from Norway and Sweden on that. Um, some more key takeaways. Uh, this is more uh, referring to um, the Nordic resistance movement. On the right here, we have a photo that's um, uh, on the right in the photo. It's uh, Simon Lindberg. He's the head of the um, Swedish chapter of Nordic resistance movement. And on the left, we have uh, Klaus Armstrong, who uh, used to be with the NPD, and he founded the party Dejatevi, the third path. Uh, this is the two of them actually in Helsinki uh, in 2009 um, during the 6 12 uh, march, uh, an independence march in Helsinki, uh, popular with right wing extremists. So, um, like I mentioned before, what, what interested me about Nordic resistance is how they were particularly well connected. Um, I found links to the Azov movement and the Azov re regiment. Um, interestingly, also the Russian imperial movement. I say interestingly because uh, from about 2015 onwards, um, the Azov regiment, a far right uh, Ukraine uh, battalion and our regiment actually fought against the, the far right Russian imperial movement on the other side. It's interesting that, for example, the um, Swedish uh, members of Nordic resistance trained actually with the Russian imperial movement, whereas the Finnish chapter seems to have closer ties to Azov. Um, we're also seeing very close connections to national action. This was uh, this has now uh, been disbanded. They actually got banned, prescribed in Britain, the, the first far right group to be banned since I believe Oswald Mosley's Union of British Fascists in the 1930s, after the uh, after national action was planning to murder uh, a Labour MP. In, uh, in Britain, they were banned. Uh, so there's this connections there. Deja Tavik, the third path I already mentioned. Then we have the JN, the uh, Junge Nationalisten, the Young Nationalists, which is the youth organization of, um, of the NPD party in Germany, and also to a Tornwaffen division. Uh, maybe just a quick side note where, where this, this international organization comes from that. Um, uh, Iron March was a far right forum. It's no longer around. It got taken offline, but um, uh, many members of the Nordic resistance movement were active on this forum where they did come into contact with neo-Nazis around the globe, in Greece, Italy, Britain, USA, et cetera. So this is maybe like um, one example of how these very real life contacts do sometimes come from uh, the, the online sphere. And uh, here we have uh, at the bottom, this is from, um, Rockigen Überfremdung, it's a far right rock festival. Um, I believe this photo was from 2017, uh, when about 7,000 people went to the uh, uh, eastern state of Thuringia to this uh, far right rock festival. So, uh, like I said, the report also focuses on far right rock festivals and mixed martial art fighting tournaments. They serve as uh, important networking events, conspiratorial meetups, uh, and lucrative microeconomies for traditional right wing extremists. So quite often it's a place where you can openly live out your ideology um, away from prying eyes of civil society. It's a place where people um, uh, will sometimes show Hitler salutes, where, where they will um, sell far right merchandise for their scene. But uh, so it has a, a radicalization function on the one hand, but um, also we're seeing that, uh, I mean, groups, for example, like Combat 18 use these mass meetups as also sort of like a, an opportunity to have a clandestine line meeting because they're all there anyway, um, whereas their, their movements would maybe be more closely monitored if they just tried to make an, uh, a meeting somewhere else away from a festival, but maybe sort of safety in numbers, uh, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the example from the photo, Rock Gegen Überfremdung, which translates as uh, rock against over foreignization um, with about 7,000 people, uh, 7,000 neo-Nazis from across Europe, so it was very important internationally. And that was organized by Tommy Flenk, who's um, a well-known uh, neo-Nazi in Germany. Um, yeah, and now uh, just a few points, key takeaways about the phenomenon of online far-right terrorism, which I mentioned at the beginning. So uh, here we actually have um, uh, a meme, uh, wolf among sheep, it could be your neighbor and you wouldn't know it, we are everywhere. And then you see on the left side, someone uh, donning a, um, uh, a kind of skull balaclava, commonly used, for example, by a Tornwaffen division. Uh, in the background, we have the black sun, uh, um, a far right symbol. Uh, and this is new form of uh, a new online international far right terror emerging from image boards, discord servers, telegram groups, which is not impossible, but it's, it's difficult to infiltrate. It functions differently than the, the classic far right structures. 
um, which is the idea that, I mean, I believe just, just yesterday or the day before, there was like the latest foiled attempt in, in Essen in Germany uh, of a, um, a far-right school kid to basically shoot up his school. This is something we're seeing increasingly uh, often, and it's a very alarming trend. Uh, I would also speak in this context of the gamification of terror. If we look at the killer in Halle, who tried to storm a synagogue a few years ago on Yom Kippur, he had a list of achievements he posted online about like how many people he could kill, how many Jews, if he did this, he would get this, you could unlock certain uh, achievements. So we're seeing this idea of not just live streaming uh, terror attacks, but also uh, turning it into a game for an online um, audience, especially on image boards. Um, we're also seeing tied into this a post-organizational nature of online far-right terrorism. So like I said, when uh, national action got banned in the UK, uh, a bunch of new groups sprung up in its place. I mean, it's not like the old um, um, method of slowly and meticulously building up a party with an identity and close structures. It's more about founding a new telegram group. Maybe there'll be a logo, maybe there won't even be a logo. Uh, and continuously redefining themselves to avoid any kind of law enforcement or a banning. Uh, but we're seeing that these smaller cells are much more fluid in, in their um, organizational forms. The increasing internationalization I've already mentioned, uh, and looking at the time, I'll just slowly move, quickly move on. Um, one alarming trend uh, relating especially to online uh, right-wing terrorism is that we're seeing um, increasingly young members being recruited. In the UK uh, recently, there was a case of that the youngest ever person um, uh, charged under anti-terrorism laws, uh, a right-wing extremist, and this person was only about 12 or 13 when they started getting uh, active in far-right terror groups on Telegram, etc., uh, sharing, for example, um, bomb manuals uh, and things like this to, to plan and attack. And uh, whilst we're talking about uh, this uh, new online form of right-wing terrorism, I just thought it'd be important to, to say um, uh, the meme at the side uh, is with the phrase wolf among sheep is playing on this uh, idea often repeated by media politicians this myth of a, a lone wolf um, I would argue against that and say we're seeing a new form of organization online but we're seeing that they have an audience we're seeing they have networks and structures uh, that also play an important role in radicalization this isn't the I mean we've now got to the point where there are so many supposed lone wolves over the past few years that we have to acknowledge that this is part of a new form of right-wing terrorism uh, and they're not Einzeltäter as we'd say in German but they're very much part of uh, a new form of, of more loose organization um, yeah so that was the end of my presentation 19 minutes more or less exactly uh, my time slot so I'll close my presentation now And yeah, thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Nick. Really impressive with the time as well. Thank you for the great cooperation and a really, really well-written report, if I may say so. <laughs> um, so with us today, we also have uh, two participants from uh, civil society organizations in Norway and Sweden, Maria Vassvik and Morgan Finscher. Um, Maria Vasvik, you work as an advisor at the Norwegian Center Against Racism. Since 2019, you've had the professional responsibility for the center's work against right-wing extremism and the center's collaboration with the trade union movement. Morgan Fincher, you work as an, a journalist, researcher and educator at the Stockholm-based Expo Foundation, and you're an expert on Swedish and transnational right-wing extremism and far-right politics. You've also contributed to several international and Swedish reports on the topic. Thank you for being here. I would like to start with your thoughts, Maria. Uh, do you recognize the, the picture that Nick is giving with his report? And do you feel that the situation is being taken seriously enough in Norway? Well, thank you so much, Nick, first for a great presentation and for the uh, excellent report and also to Josephine and the FES Nordic countries for organizing this seminar. Um, this is very useful uh, and yes, uh, very much so. I do recognize the overall picture Nick is giving in the report. Um, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't feel that the situation is taken seriously enough 
uh, in Norway, uh, even after not only one, uh, but two very serious right-wing attacks uh, in the recent years. Uh, and we don't even have to talk about the Nazis uh, that are not so well organized in Norway. Um, I mean, you write in the report uh, uh, and about the report from parliaments to the streets. Uh, and my friend and old colleague, Shwaib Sultan, is cited in the section on the Progress Party, uh, who are not only in parliament, but recently in government as well, about their dog whistle politics uh, and how their rhetoric uh, is falling just short of providing grounds for prosecution, which has had a clear impact on the Norwegian politics. Um, what was seen as an extremist position a few years ago is now public policy. Uh, and at the Norwegian Centre Against Racism, we focused a lot on this relationship between the parliament, uh, the populist and radical right wing politicians and the, the streets. Uh, and they have been very effective in moving the boundaries on what's acceptable to say, uh, especially uh, in relation to the topics of immigration and Islam. Uh, and I think we've let them off way too easily uh, compared to, uh, for example, the Swedish Democrats, and maybe even because of the comparison with them. Um, and we see uh, that their politics are uh, still based on conspiracy theories, uh, on the theory about the great replacement, the threat of Islamization, uh, and they still uh, in recent debates, refused to stop using the term sneak Islamization. Um, and I think that maybe because of especially the role of the Progress Party, what you write about this new form about uh, this new form for of far right terrorism, how it's often portrayed by the media and politicians uh, as both the result of mental illness and acts by lone wolves. Uh, it's very problematic uh, and very relevant in the, the Norwegian uh, context. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Morgan, do you recognize the perspectives from Nick's report and Maria's from, from the Norwegian situation? Uh, yes, uh, very much yes to both. Uh, first of all, thank you, Safin and FES for the invitation and for organizing this. And thank you, Nick, for the excellent report and, and for the presentation. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I think, first of all, I would, I would like to say about the report that I, I, um, I, I would particularly like to highlight some of the takeaways that I, that I think are very important. Um, uh, well, the policy recommendations as well, or, or, or everyone should, should uh, take a look at those. I also think that it's it's uh, very useful that in the report you highlight the role of um, anti-feminism as a mobilizing factor and as a key ideological component of the contemporary uh, right-wing extremism that we're seeing. Uh, I think not a lot, uh, not enough um, scholars and researchers are are highlighting that that very important factor. Um, uh, you 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 uh, in your discussion of the Nordic resistance movement, you mentioned that. Uh, you you have found uh, as you look at them now that they are uh, currently in a, in a in a stage of decline, which is true. But I I would like to point out that um, this decline should also not be um, it, it is real. But but the thing about the Nordic resistance movement is that they have been around for twenty five years, which is a long time for a Swedish right wing extremist organization. They have a type of organization that is hierarchical and obviously. Uh, transnational in its very essence, having um, junior branches in the neighboring countries, uh, other than Sweden, where it's based, and other organizational features that um, make this organization very durable. Uh, and it has gone through splits before, it has gone through downturns before, and each time it has emerged stronger. So the, uh, as, as we argue in a recently uh, published report on the NRM, there's still very much a security threat. And in fact, the, the very fact that they've been losing members in the past couple of years, that they've gone through a split and are sort of shrinking currently as an organization uh, might actually uh, uh, take them in a direction uh, similar to, to the one that they were taking in, in the uh, beginning of the previous decade when they actually exhibited a very violent mode of operation where they, in order to, to um, consolidate their position and their prestige in the right-wing extremist milieu, um, engaged in a number of unprovoked attacks, uh, knife attacks on people, on immigrants, 
uh, and other violent behavior. So, so um, there's still troubling um, security aspects to the NRM, even though they are currently uh, in, in a period of, of decline. Um, yes, I, I also think that it's valuable, important that you uh, discuss the radical right parties in this report, um, the Sweden Democrats, for example, in Sweden, which, um, you know, contrary to, to a lot of the expectations of pundits in Sweden, did not necessarily moderate as much as people would have expected when they grew to the size that they currently are. They're currently the third biggest party in the Swedish parliament. Um, they are expected to form some part of the, uh, um, the, the, um, the opposition's uh, attempt to form a government uh, in case they win the upcoming election. This is an election year in Sweden. Um, and they have not moderated to the extent that people uh, you know, predicted or expected, or at least that some people predicted and expected. Um, instead, we're seeing that, for example, this election cycle, they've been escalating their anti-Muslim rhetoric to a rather troubling uh, level, tr troubling degree. The party secretary just recently stated that, um, to paraphrase, that uh, Islam does not belong in this country, for example, uh, and, and other very troubling statements. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's important to 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 highlight the the um, um, to highlight the the role that the Sweden Democrats currently play in sort of um, uh, disseminating uh, right wing ideology and and intolerance uh, in Sweden as well. Um, but I'll leave it there, and I'm, uh, perhaps we'll discuss some of these uh, questions uh, later on as well. Perfect. Thank you. So I got some questions for you, but also the other participants, if you if you have uh, thoughts um, or, or questions that you would like us to um, bring up, um, post them in the chat. So the report shows that the far right is going digital, but also exemplifies music festivals and MM MMA tournaments. Would you say that these online forums are replacing physical meetings, or is it rather that the outreach has gotten bigger? You talk about these younger um, group groups that they are reaching um, online, for example. Uh, yeah, physical events are still very important um, and lucrative. Um, the pandemic has obviously put a spanner in the works. There has been um, cases of, of streaming events, um, also uh, streaming um, fighting tournaments as well. Um, sometimes with, um, uh, you have to buy tickets as well. So still trying to recuperate uh, some of the income, but I mean, financially it's been uh, a big loss for like the far right event uh, sphere. But I'd say that not that long before the pandemic, we had a far right rock festival in Germany that attracted seven, up to 7,000 neo-Nazis from across Europe. So, I mean, um, it's more attracting traditional far right players like hammer skins are very important for uh, for the far right rock scene uh, for example um, combat 18 uh, through their blood and honor network both are banned in germany but this has traditionally always been quite close to far right rock music and so we're talking about very physical events um the old networks work in this way i think the trust is is important uh, these physical meetups um getting into this like very closed groups as in essentially so that's not gone away but at the same time we, we're just witnessing a new phenomenon where we do have this newer younger generation i mentioned the word terrogram earlier um, i mentioned put this post-organizational structure we're seeing seeing people uh, groups emerge from online forums discord servers uh, telegram groups um this is where i currently see the biggest threat of, of far-right violence especially deadly violence um uh, I would maybe just add that I don't necessarily think that any one particular online space is replacing the traditional physical space spaces. I think even in the digital realm, there's a hierarchy of communication. So you'd maybe get an online forum or something more open. This is where people first uh, get into contact with one another. Um, then you would maybe get invited to a Discord channel or something like this. And from there, maybe a, a closed encrypted uh, Telegram group or something like this. 
uh, and that's where like the very radical stuff happens in a way. So it's like a it's like a, t a tunnel or a process of, of radicalization. So there's not any one particular online space that's that's um, replacing uh, the the traditional physical events. They're both happening parallel at the same time. And even in the digital space, there's a, there's a, a hierarchy of like what's said in what context. And there is still this element of of trust and and building up relationships in the online sphere before you're invited to the you know the the inner clique. Mm -hmm. We got this question from Susie Meredith. Um, she asks, uh, can you develop a bit more on the connections and posi positioning of the far right to the war in Ukraine and particular to in, re in, re in relation to the Azov battalion? Do you, do you also see splits and growing disagreements with the radical right as positions towards the role of Russia? Um, and then also spe special uh, thanks on this uh, anti-gender aspect um, for, from the from the report. Um, but before you start, I would also really like to hear how, if your work have been affected uh, by the the Russian rhetorics uh, making all enemies of Russia Nazi. If you've had effects on your work there, so I don't know how we maybe. Nick, if you would like to start with the first part, maybe, and then, then I would really like to hear from Morgan and Maria as well on this on the second part of the question. Does that sound okay? Okay, so the first part of the question is uh, the response of the far right to the Azov regiment. And the second part of the question is whether uh, Putin's uh, like denazification rhetoric has had an impact on our work. Is, yeah. is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So um, I can mostly speak about the far right in Germany in this context. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to hear what uh, what um, Maria and Morgan have to say about uh, the situation in their countries. Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely it's been a, a moment of, of division, uh, definitely within the far right in Germany. There, um, I think, uh, one of the most prominent um, uh, voices. I mean, wrong. Der Dritte Weg, the third path, is often, uh, I would say, wrongly uh, framed as being pro-Ukrainian and against Russia. I think that this is uh, not correct, but they are one of the most vocal supporters of the Azov movement and the Azov regiment. They have close contacts with them. They visited them several times. They have uh, long been uh, in awe of uh, this strong paramilitary far-right movement in Ukraine. Uh, so there's there's been this connection for a while. Um, with the war happening now, um, it's important to stress that neo-Nazis like from Der Dritte Weg, or there's a, a, a split-off party called uh, Neue Stärke, New Strength. Uh, they're also it's a very in the same vein, uh, very pro-Azov. Um, to say that they're 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 fighting for the same Ukraine that Zelensky believes in, to this pro-democratic, pro-Western Ukraine, is wrong. I think that they just uh, see a chance through a, a war situation to um, increase the power of the far in Ukraine. Um, at the same time, yes, it's a divisive issue. There are there are like parts of the party Die Rechte, the right, and also the NPD have, uh, have always been traditionally much more pro-Russia, pro-Putin. Um, you even have like a new far-right party, Die Freien Sachsen, the Free Saxonians, I guess. Um, and uh, they they're basically saying that uh, like uh, Donetsk and Luhansk today, Saxony tomorrow. So they're sort of like framing this own like separatist struggle as their own struggle against Berlin, which is really uh, very quite bizarre actually. Uh, so yes, it's a divisive issue, but what I am seeing a lot since the beginning of the war is, um, especially on Telegram, a lot of German neo-Nazis claiming to want to go over and fight alongside Azov uh, against um, against Russia. I'm not seeing the same, I'm not seeing many people actually wanting, to, claiming to want to go and fight on the side of Russia. Uh, but I would have to stress there that these people claiming and boasting on Telegram that they're going to go and fight uh, alongside Azov, um, the actual numbers and evidence we have so far uh, speaks for the fact that this is actually mostly just people, you know, boasting on Telegram and not really following through, thankfully. Morgan, do you want to add something on the Swedish? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, it's it's an interesting uh, thing to, to, to see. Certainly, to, to answer the question concretely, um, the Swedish far-right scene, the Swedish right-wing extremist scene has certainly been divided by the escalation of the war in the Ukraine, by the full-scale invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine. Um, similarly to how they were sort of uh, divided over the pandemic and how to respond to that and to find a common ideological line uh, as opposed, uh, uh, as relates to that. When it comes to the, the current escalation of the war, um, 
there's division not only within the scene between different groups, but also um, or between different groups, but also within the groups themselves, between their, their members. They have different opinions. Some uh, are more sympathetic to the Ukrainian side, some are more sympathetic to the Russian side. Um, it's different from 2014 in, in, in certain ways. In 2014, uh, initially, most of the Swedish right-wing scene or extremist scene um, sympathized with, with Ukraine. There were certain um, uh, several uh, foreign uh, um, volunteers coming from Sweden going down to, to, to fight on the Ukrainian side. Then uh, fall in, in 2015 and, and afterwards, um, there was a sort of um, sh shift um, in the attitude of the Swedish right-wing extremists um, with regards to the Ukraine and, and Russia, in part because of uh, what we could, you know, um, reductively describe as successful diplomacy by pro-Russian organizations such as the Russian Imperial Movement, which sort of made a diplomatic push um, uh, uh, towards uh, the Nordic resistance movement with whom they had long-standing ties, but the Russian imperial movement sort of intensified their diplomacy and got the Nordic resistance movement to, um, you know, more clearly side with Russia uh, geopolitically. And of course, as, as I think Nick mentioned initially and, and certainly mentions in the report, um, uh, infamously, uh, some members of the Nordic resistance movement were trained by uh, the partisan uh, paramilitary training program run by uh, the Russian imperial movement's um, uh, armed wing. Um, the hope and the expectation, obviously, on, on the Russian side was that these uh, Nordic resistance movement uh, uh, members would then go on to fight on the Russian side in Ukraine. Uh, what happened instead with those members uh, were, was that they went back to Sweden and conducted a series of, of uh, bombing attacks targeting asylum uh, uh, seekers and, and uh, leftists, a uh, series of bombing attacks that, that the US State Department uh, has, has called uh, acts of terror. And one which was uh, one reason why the Russian imperial movement was subsequently designated a terror group by the US State Department. Um, since then, since, since the Russian imperial movement was designated a terror group, um, the Nordic resistance movement has kept a lower profile and played down the relationship with that group. And currently, um, even though they have historically in the past several years been more pro-Russian, currently um, in a sort of reflection of the, the confusion about this issue in the Swedish right-wing extremist scene, they are saying that, well, both sides are bad and they aren't prohibiting their members and sympathizers from going down to fight but they're saying, you know, you shouldn't. They're urging them not to go. And this is a much more standoffish approach than we saw in 2014. Back then, there were organizations, you know, actively encouraging their members to go and fight on the Ukrainian side. Right now, there are no, um, as far as we know, there are no Swedish organizations telling their members um, to do, uh, to, to, to go down. We, we are seeing some people, um, as Nick, Nick was saying, uh, some people are boasting or suggesting on, on social media that they are, are, do intend to go. We know that a handful of people have gone from Sweden to fight, but it, this seems to have been on their own individual initiative. Uh, some of them are saying that they would like to fight with the Azov regiment, whether that actually uh, would be possible for them to do or whether that ends up happening is a, is a totally um, uh, separate question. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose that was a long answer, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but uh, we can pick that up again if it's interesting. So Maria, what about the Norwegian movement? Well, I, I, I hear what both uh, Morgan and, and Nick is saying, and I, I, I have to say that um, I, I'm quite sure that there are other people that would answer that question better regarding the, the Norwegian context. Uh, but what I do know is that we see uh, quite a chaotic uh, situation uh, and some of the same divisions uh, in the Norwegian situation. Um, uh, I mean, we've seen uh, some of the organized Nazis are, are taking a stance against Russia. Uh, and then we see some of the, 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 the far right parties, I would call them, or some of the main characters um, are taking a very hard stance against uh, NATO. Uh, and with them, you also have um, some of the I don't know, supposedly left-wing profiles. Uh, I would maybe say that they're more, that they're not so much left-wing, but they're more 
conspiracy theorists um, um, and then also we've seen um, uh, identitarians uh, traveling down to Ukraine, uh, helping refugees, uh, asking people to come down and, and join them. Um, uh, but I don't want, I, I'm, I'm not sure what to answer uh, uh, regarding going down to, to fight. Uh, that's, uh, I don't have the, the full picture. So I'm, maybe some of the, uh, the attendees uh, know more about that than I do. If I could just add something. Um, yeah, do. Yeah, uh, so I'll just lower my hand there. Okay, so with regards to the, uh, I, I, I feel like I should add that, that with regards to the other end of the spectrum of the far right, that these radical right parties that Nick also discusses in the report, when it comes to the Sweden Democrats, for example, here we're seeing uh, an, you know, another rather sort of clear effect of the, the, the current war uh, escalation uh, in, in Ukraine, where the Sweden Democrats have, like many of their counterparts around Europe, obviously had pro-Russian orientations, pro made pro-Russian statements, have had certain ties uh, to Russian politics. And this, of course, became a major source of embarrassment for them once the, the current escalation began. And the Sweden Democrats in particular have been very eager to, uh, you know, to, to, to shift the focus uh, and and to to um, move the attention away from their uh, historical ties to Russia, and this has, you know, been only partly uh, successful, as it were. Um, recently, the um, the uh, the spokesman of the Sweden Democrat Party uh, for defense and security policy, and also uh, uh, one of their the senior member of theirs in the um, parliament's um, uh, defense committee. Uh, had to resign after um, my organization, the Expo Foundation, revealed that he had been sharing a video on social media, uh, a video, basically a conspiracist and pro-Russian video, thanking Russia for the invasion of the Ukraine and alleging and or suggesting that there were um, bioweapons labs that George Soros and uh, basically some, some kind of nefarious Jewish uh, actors were um, planning to use against Christian Russians to wipe out Christians but spare Jews with some kind of bioweapon and so on. So, and this became a scandal, and the, the Sweden Democratic um, um, parliamentarian in, in the um, Defense Committee had to resign. So, this has been a, a tough issue for them, and I would argue that this dynamic is also behind their escalation in, um, uh, you know, ranting about Islam and ranting about Muslims in recent months and recent weeks. Uh, in particular, I think they're very grateful for the provocations and distractions offered by the Danish right-wing extremist Rasmus Paladan, who's currently touring Sweden and burning um, Korans and, and uh, sort of, you know, um, attempting to, to destabilize the country as much as possible. And the Sweden Democrats have latched onto this and uh, in a sort of desperation to change the subject, subject from Russia and their own historic ties to Russia, they would rather, uh, you know, um, rant about Islam. So we're, we're seeing that as a kind of knockoff effect of the current crisis as well in terms of Swedish domestic politics. So I would just like to, to jump yeah, in there and say something that, uh, that was very interesting. Thank you, Mong. Uh, just to, to throw in something about the AFD there as well. I would agree it's a similar situation in Germany. Um, the Russia's war in Ukraine is, uh, is a conundrum for the AFD. They haven't really been able to get any political capital out of it at all. Uh, on the contrary, um, the party has traditionally always been more pro-Russian, pro-Putin. Uh, this puts them in a massive predicament now. So like um, the heads of the party were fairly quick to call it um, Putin's war of aggression against the Ukraine. Um, but there was a lot of resistance in the, the basically the rank and file of the party. If you look at social media comments, a lot of people um, did not find this good at all. Um, it did not really resonate. At the same time, there are other uh, party uh, leaders at, at, at other levels of the party who say very different things. Um, bizarrely, the AFD is now trying to position itself as some kind of peace party, like the only party that's against uh, uh, delivery of weapons, who is against the war and everything. So it's, 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 a, it's a weird role, but not really a role they've been able to profit from so far. We got a few more questions uh, from, from the chat, and I thought maybe we could, we have 10 minutes left. So let's see if we can uh, give them some short answers. Uh, one is, will Sweden ban the Nordic resistance movement? 
can we, <laughs> Morgan? Uh, yeah, I'll try to give the, the shortest possible answer to yeah. this. Um, right now, it's not looking as though Sweden will ban the Nordic resistance movement. There is currently a legislative process uh, to ban racist organizations, which you know putatively would would include at least the NRM, the most clear possible example of a racist organization in Sweden. However, the committee that produced the legislative proposal was sort of torn in half by uh, by, uh, by political disagreements, um, and they produced a, a rather sort of kind of compromise proposal that was sort of watered down and that raised a lot of questions as to what would this affect you know any group even the NRM um, and and um, the proposal was not to to offer the possibility to prescribe groups at all but to criminalize collaboration with or participation in the activity of a group so there's a lot of contradictions and question marks surrounding this and uh, we haven't seen the final form of the um, law proposal yet, which has to come from, from the government itself. And it will be interesting to see what form that takes. But currently, um, there's a lot, a lot to suggest that the, the same factors that have prevented Sweden for, for several decades and during several rounds of previous attempts to produce such a law, the same factors that have held Sweden back, which is, um, you know, um, Political political interpretations of the constitution, um, a view that you know banning organizations is not the right way to go, etc. The feeling that we already have laws on the books that fulfill Sweden's obligations um, towards the, the the UN Convention that does say that you should ban racist organizations. Um, that these factors might might end up you know creating the same situation as before. That that, that there will be no ban. But it is an ongoing legislative process, and the final word has not been said. So, um, but but no one should be betting any money that that Sweden will ban the NRM in the same way that Finland has, for example. Um, unfortunately, I think personally, but there are you know there are different perspectives on this, and there are good arguments you know against such a ban as well. But you know, personally, I, I I'm slightly disappointed with with how the process has turned out. You talked about money. One question we also got was um, regarding financing. Uh, and um, we're also going to talk about the policy suggestions a little bit just um, here at the end. And the question is, what is, I uh, follow the mo money, what is the potential for fighting right wing extremism through going um, after the, the funding side? Is it possible to answer that like pretty short? <laughs> There's a lot of potential. It would be really good to stop them having lots, generating lots of money. Uh, all I can say is that um, uh, the Germany's interior minister, Nancy Faeser, uh, recently introduced a, a 10 point action plan against right wing extremism, where uh, she made it very clear that um, drying out the financial sources of, of the extreme right is one of her priorities. Uh, and this, these points were also um, reiterated by the head of Germany's notor notorious uh, Verfassungsschutz uh, and also of the, the federal police. So yes, obviously, um, if we can stop them getting lots of money, this is good for everyone except them. <laughs> Would you say that's the same case in Norway and Sweden? Would that help? I think uh, I think it would help. Uh, I, I think that um, you know the the assessment has been for a long time that the sort of financial flows and the economic uh, strength of the groups within the Swedish right wing extremist scene have been relatively modest. But I mean, money is the sinew uh, sinews of of their activity, and uh, there's certainly evidence that, for example, the Nordic resistance movement is increasingly shifting to uh, various forms of cryptocurrency uh, in, in handling their money because they have been shut down by several banks. And um, uh, so the, these money flows are becoming increasingly opaque and, and they do need to be looked at more closely. And uh, you know, there's no reason that these very violent groups, anti-democratic groups, the Nordic Assistance Movement is you know, openly you know, saying that they want to overthrow democracy through uh, force. And, and replace it with a Nazi dictatorship. So, you know, a democratic society has every reason to want to look more closely at these cash flows and, and to, to stop them where possible. So absolutely, that, that is certainly an area that should be looked at a lot more. So we got one um, uh, response when we uh, sent the invitation and the report out, the, the first round, um, asking, uh, 
why there's almost no mention uh, of women in this report. Is it a blind spot? Uh, are there female networks that we need to know and keep track of? Nick? Uh, I'll say? keep the answer as short as I can. Yeah. Uh, I'll great. start with an, uh, an anecdote. Um, about a year or two ago at the Amadeo Antonio Foundation, we did a, a report, our own report just on right-wing terrorism. We always gender our language in German. Uh, and this report was the first report where we decided not consciously not to gender it because we uh, couldn't find any examples of uh, far-right terrorism with a death count that had been uh, carried out just mm -hmm. by um, a woman. Um, there are female figures within the far-right in the AFD, there's Beatrix von Storch, there's uh, Alice Weidel, mm -hmm. even the NSU, the core trio mm -hmm. of the NSU, there was Beata Cheper. Um, we also have uh, female far-right influencers online. They also pay an important ideological function for radicalization. One example uh, I found in my research for this report was from the NRM. It was a uh, uh, Vera Oretson. Uh, I saw her in a photo with actually with the Hammerskins um, <laughs> in their clubhouse. Um, but a lot of groups, Hammerskins, the Third Path, as a Dejita League, uh, the Soldiers of Odin, they have a very uh, heavily male-dominated hierarchical leadership structure that doesn't really allow for uh, female presence in the upper echelons. And with the online right-wing terrorism I outlined, uh, to date, uh, I'm not aware of a single case of this new form of online far terrorism that was carried out by a female. Super, thank you. So I would like to end the seminar with the question, um, looking closer at these um, policy suggestions, or I would like to hear um, if you have any, if you, we, we have this uh, upcoming seminar with, progressive and social democratic PMs coming up, where we're presenting the report. And I would like to hear what you think that we should push, what policy proposals should be the first one on the, on the list. There's no, there's no shortcut solution to combating right-wing extremism. That would, be a, that would be treating a gunshot wound with a Band-Aid. Um, any approach needs to focus on law enforcement, prevention, political education, and above all, support for the victims. I think this is very important. But while we talk about other measures about how civil society needs to be better funded, researchers need to be protected, I mean, there's a whole list of measures. Uh, if I had to have a wish list and, uh, and say, well, can we please start with this one? I would start with two, and there's around six to 700 open arrest warrants for right-wing extremists just in Germany. I would like to see them carried out. <laughs> Uh, and there's about 1,200 right-wing extremists in Germany who legally own firearms. I would like to see them disarmed and their licenses revoked. Whilst we talk about all of the other things that are also highly important, because like I said, this strategy needs to really be four-pronged, uh, I would like to remove the immediate acute threat that we're seeing that there are violent neo-Nazis with weapons and some of them have arrest warrants and they're still out there. Thank you. Super. Maria, what, what would be on your wish list? Mm. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that even, even with, with the Labour Party now in, in government, we see a certain, I, I don't know, reluctancy um, to, 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 deal, to deal with these issues. Uh, so what we, what we really want uh, is uh, the politicians uh, to take a more clear stance to begin with. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I... I we agree on all the policy proposals, but I, I, I think within the Norwegian context, we're not, uh, we're not there uh, when it comes to many of the specific ones. Uh, but I think, of course, the section on, on law enforcement, uh, actually, when it comes to using the laws that are already in place, Mm. Um, but of course, also, like I, I mentioned, the concrete, uh, like uh, concrete efforts to halt the spread of conspiracy theories, um, and also, of course, the the proposals on structural work on on racism. I think it's very uh, interesting to see the 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 proposal on the on an, uh, for an independent commissioner on anti-Semitism, racism, discrimination, uh, mm. but then, of course, with adequate resources and a clear mandate. Yeah, of course. Great. Thank you. Morgan? Yeah, just briefly. And, and instead of going into detail about the many proposals that are in the report, which I really think are good, 
um, uh, and, and, you know, discussing differences between the German and the Swedish situation and so on, which is an interesting topic. But instead, I'll just say that, um, as Nicholas says, um, you know, you do need a, a, a multi-pronged approach. There are many uh, areas that you need to look at. And without the, the political leadership, without the political prioritization of this issue, the security threat, this political threat, this, this social threat, um, you know, none of them will happen, or maybe just a few of them will happen, and it won't have this, you know, a holistic uh, approach and effect that, that you need. And I think the, the situation in Germany is a little bit different, where political leaders have been much more clear that, you know, fighting right-wing extremism is a priority, at least, you know, on the on the rhetorical level. I, I, I can't speak to the, you know, how serious these efforts have been. But in Sweden, there's still, you know, a, a great uh, naivete about this issue. For some reason, even though you know we've had right-wing extremism in Sweden since you know 1924, uh, almost a hundred a century of you know of unbroken fascist organizing in this country, and yet you know the authorities and the government are still not really taking this issue seriously, not really you know putting it on the table as a political priority. So that's what I that that's also something that civil society I think should urge politicians to do, and then because then when it is a priority, when it is a, you know declared as a serious issue then people will start looking at all the things that, that have to be done and, and will start taking these policy recommendations more seriously, I think. So yeah, political leadership. Perfect. Thank you. There's lots to, to be done. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for contributing today. Um, and, you know, Maria, Morgan, Nick, I hope we, you know, there's still so many questions left and so many things that we need to... Uh, discuss more third, further but I'm sure that will be uh, there will be other rounds um, and we'll, we'll ha we have the, sh uh, the questions I'll look through them and see if there's something that I can pass on to you or we'll see what, what we can do about that um, don't forget to download load the report if you haven't done that yet and um, thank you so much um, hope to see you on a seminar soon again Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.